creating cultural awareness and understanding. This is Culture Click. Culture Click is written and produced by KQAL FM on the campus of Winona State University. Today on Culture Click, we return to the No Name Bar for another nerdtastic nerd night. And if you haven't heard of this nerdy event, Nerd Night is a monthly history channel with beer held at the No Name Bar, where three lucky Winonans present their passions proudly. So if you have a nerdy hobby or concerningly obsessed with topics till you're considered a nerd, Nerd Night is a place to be. I'm Del Nazate, here to present you part three of Nerd Night 33, today on Culture Click. All right, all right. So we got a couple of really quick announcements before our last talk uh, by Adam Beardsley. Uh, the first is we just want to plug the next event, which is February 28th. Um, uh, we're going to have a talk by Andre Bailey, who leads Little Warriors Drumline. We are not actually having a drumline in No Name Bar, but the guy who runs it is going to talk about it, which is great. Uh, we, uh, there's another talk about carbon credits by somebody named David Ruff. I don't know who that is. Uh, and then uh, somebody talking about fish biology from the U.S. Geological Survey. So it'll be pretty great. Uh, if you, yeah, thank you. So we, <laughs> uh, if you, we are always looking for speakers, people interested in talking. Uh, you can visit us on Facebook or uh, just email us to, to sign up or t- come talk to us too. You know who the bosses are. Um, a lot of us picked up new hobbies and things during the pandemic. A lot of us have really interesting things that, you know, we know a lot about, and it's great. And uh, we would love to hear about your nerdy passion, so come find us. Uh, probably the best way to figure out what's going on with Nerd Night, to hear about new events, is to, to add us on Facebook. Uh, or now uh, we are updating our website. <laughs> so we have one of these newfangled websites, too. So you can check us out there. I know. Uh, And then one other thing that we wanted to plug is the first Nerd Night book, which is coming out in February. Uh, And you can pre-order it now. We actually have Liz Russell, who's a professor of psychology at uh, Winona State, wrote a chapter for this book uh, about her talk about video games, which was pretty, pretty great. So order that. All right, and with that, uh, I would like to introduce our last speaker, Adam Beardsley, who's a professor of physics at Winona State University. He's going to talk about radio astronomy, and you can too. So give it up for Adam. All right, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, Maybe I need like a long sleepy straw or something. Um, Okay. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm going to try to make this short and sweet. Um, I'm not going to show you complicated plots. I'm just going to try to show you a bunch of nice, pretty pictures. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of overlap between mine and Carl and Cody's talks. It's funny, we, we, we live in a hallway right next to each other, but we didn't talk to each other at all. So there's like some, we have the same slides. There are other times where we should have had the same slides, and we don't. Um, so anyway, here we go. I'm going to talk about um, radio astronomy and stuff. Um, I had a little slide about like who I am, Professor uh, Winnow State. Um, I, I do a lot of like data analysis, that kind of stuff, and I like to build telescopes. Um, as Carl mentioned, when you do astronomy, you don't usually think about it this way, but a lot of astronomers get to go to a lot of cool places in the world. Um, so I just, it's not a contest, but... Um, <laughs> uh, here's a telescope that I work on, it's in Australia. This is a fun one to get to. You fly like 16 hours to... Um, Sydney or some city in Australia, you fly another four hours to go to the other side of Australia. It's a big country. Um, And then you drive another like six hours to get to the middle of nowhere, outback Australia, and there's your telescope. That's a telescope. And I'm not going to talk too much about how it works, but it's a telescope. It's basically like a bunch of little like rabbit ear antennas that sit on the ground. Um, Another telescope that might look more like one that you think about, um, a bunch of dishes that sit out in the desert. Um, This one's in South Africa. To get to this one, you fly 10 hours to London, and then 10 hours down to Cape Town, and then you drive another four hours out into the desert. Um, and then you, you, you fight with your telescope for a few days, and then you come back. Um, so uh, that's kind of fun. Um, I was told that I should... One, one thing I should point out about radio astronomy or radio in general is a common misconception. Radio is not sound. Okay? Despite what Jodie Foster and Carl Sagan may <laughs> lead you to believe, um, if you guys have seen the movie Contact, um, 
radio astronomers do not do this for the most part. Every you know, there's quirk, there's always quirky nerds that do things like this who turn their data into sound. But that's something that you have to do. Um, we use the same radio technology to beam sound to our radio devices that we can listen to them. But you know, that, that that's not what the radio actually is. We use the radio to convey that sound. Um, Oh, and I just thought it'd be fun to also show that same telescope I got to visit. Um, it's in New Mexico. Um, so, so I get it, like, you know, it makes a pretty picture, right, for a movie. Great. My photographer maybe wasn't as good. Um, <laughs> what's maybe not captured in that image, though, is just how freaking big that thing is. I don't think that Jodie Foster got to go on to the dishes. Um, they're freaking huge. Um, 20, uh, 25 meters uh, across. Um, each one of them. Um, but anyway, I digress. So if radio is not sound, what is it? Um, you guys probably saw a slide in, I think, both of the, of the previous talks that kind of showed different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have our visible light. Um, most of astronomy is done by observing light. Um, even infrared light, um, it, it, it's still light. Um, now, not all Astronomy is done that way. Um, you have gravitational waves and things like that, but most of it's done by observing light. And you guys saw this slide already. Um, we can look at different colors or different wavelengths of the light. So you have electric fields that are bouncing around and they have different sizes, right? So red is a longer wavelength. It's more spread out than blue is, which is shorter. Um, and then we can extrapolate that out to all the things. I'm really bad at holding this in a fixed place. Um, <coughs> Hold on. This will help. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, so if we go into that region where we can't see, you go to the infrared and then you just keep going. You have microwaves, which is just like your microwave oven at home. Um, and then you keep going and then you end up in the radio. Um, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. So observing radio waves, um, which are very uh, long wavelength or low frequency is the way we like to think about it as astronomers. Um, so that's what I do. Let's talk a little bit about why. Why do you want to do radio astronomy? Um, uh, the number one reason, I would say, is science. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't understand> <laughs> Get in there. All right. So uh, I just threw together like a couple of examples of what you can do with radio astronomy. Um, you guys have seen other examples of like how different wavelengths you can see different things. So here's an optical image of something called the Crab Nebula. Um, it's a Hubble image, Jen. <laughs> um, and you can learn a lot about the, this nebula um, by observing an optical. Um, what, this is like one of the coolest things I think you can do in astronomy is you can actually look at things as they change. Um, it changes very, very slowly, but you can observe this thing over time and see that like this is actually a shell that's expanding out, right? Um, it, this is all optical. I'm not claiming any of this. Um, so, so it's expanding out, and you can extrapolate, or yeah, you can extrapolate it backwards in time, and you find that it started out as a very small thing about a thousand years ago. Um, and, and I think the estimate I have it written in my little notes here between 1040 to 1070 AD, um, uh, which matches very closely to a supernova that was recorded by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054, um, which is. It's amazing. So, like, we were able to kind of corroborate that that um, that observation a thousand years later, um, and say something huge happened, right? Um, and so, there are reasons that you we think that there should be something kind of that remains in the middle. Um, and so, you go observe in different wavelengths, and you find in radio anyway, you can see what's called a pulsar right in the middle of that nebula, um, and it shines very brightly. Uh, and what's amazing about this is, so this is basically a neutron star. Um, it's about the size of Winona, um, so several like miles on, a, like several miles in size, and it's spinning 30 times a second. So imagine going across Winona and back 30 times a second. <laughs> this is crazy stuff um, that happens out in the extreme universe, um, and yeah, so. So you can see that, and then you can also see all the, the I label this synchrotron. This is basically like electrons that are spinning around really, really fast around magnetic fields. So that's, that's kind of cool. You can kind of see things that, yeah, so you can see, see things that you couldn't see in optical. Great. 
um, what is actually producing the radio waves. So in this case, you have stuff that's like electrons spinning around. Um, that will produce radio waves. Another um, really, really useful tool that we have as radio astronomers is something called the hydrogen 21 centimeter line. Um, so hydrogen gas, which I've denoted with this cartoon picture, is a little proton and an electron. Um, and the proton and electron have different orientation. They can, they can be like facing different directions. And if they flip to going from being in different directions to being in the same direction, they will emit light. So it's different energy levels and some light will be emitted out and it's at a very, very specific wavelength, 21 centimeters or 1.4 gigahertz if you like frequency. Um, Emily alluded to the fact that astronomers like to go back and forth and um, sorry, I just do that. <laughs> um, so so uh, uh, this 21 centimeter line, we use it in radio astronomy. I'll show you in a minute one example, but before I do that, just want to say, like, this is, we've used this so much in our understanding of the universe as we observe what's around us. We use it so much that in the 70s, when we decided to send a message out to ET um, on the Voyager Golden Record. <laughs> Excellent. I, I, had, like, I want to know more about it. I've only just read the little blurbs. It's super cool. Um, but... You're sending a message out to a civilization that you have no reference with. And I have three students in the back there. Um, you guys know how much I harp about units. How do you define a unit? ET doesn't know what a meter is. ET doesn't know what a second is. You have to define it. We used the 21 centimeter line to say, this is a, like the time that it takes. That's one time unit. The wavelength, that's one length unit. That's how we like said, this is how big things are in the universe. And on the golden record, you can see the hydrogen uh, little pictogram down in the corner there. And that's how it's like, it's used to kind of decode how do you actually play this record. Um, it's a really fun game. See if you can pull up the, the record and try to decode it yourself. It's near impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I know how it works and I still can't figure it out. Um, okay, so what can we do with the 21 centimeter line? Here's a great example. Um, I'm, this is another one where I'm going to show you optical and radio. So we can look out at a galaxy. This is uh, M33, just some galaxy. I don't know. I don't keep track of individual galaxies. Um, and we can look at all the starlight. You guys are probably sick of hearing about stars. But we can look at all the starlight, and we can make... Okay, I promise this is like the only plot. <laughs> all right, all right. So we can look at... As you go out from the center of the galaxy, how fast is the galaxy spinning? Okay? Um, and you can do, you can like look at all the starlight, you can make predictions about how fast it should be moving. Um, I actually have my first year intro physics students do this, look at like, okay, some model for the mass distribution, how fast should things be spinning? And then you observe, crap, they're moving way faster than they should. Does anybody know what the answer is? Why they move faster? Dark matter, yes. So this is one of many uh, pieces of evidence for what we call dark matter. The, the galaxy is more massive than it should be, okay? That's all optical, but then we look into the 21 centimeter radio. What we can do, so the stars kind of stop here. They go out to maybe like, you know, 20,000 light years, but we don't have any more stars left. But in the radio, it goes way, way out. So there's actually two things here that we learned. There's gas that goes way out, you know, three times as far as the stars, and the dark matter does too. The dark matter is all the way out there because this continues to keep going up faster and faster when it should be going down. So that's another cool thing that you can do in, with radio astronomy. Um, other things you can do with radio astronomy... We can just make pictures of the whole sky. Why not? So <laughs> um, this is like if you take like a Google map kind of thing and, you, you know, if you like zoom all the way out to see the whole Earth, it probably projects it in some way. Um, this is one specific way that you can project a sphere. But you turn it inside out, right? So rather than looking down at the Earth, we're looking up at the sky. And um, this was data, this was um, observations that were done in New Mexico, or sorry, California. Um, and... You see like tons and tons of features here. Um, 
Does anybody want to guess what this is going on here? Yeah, it's the blind spot from the earth, right? We're in California. You can't see a lot of the, what's in the south. Okay, so that's that big gap there. Um, we have like the galactic plane. That's like the Milky Way galaxy. We have the North Galactic Spur. This is like, we're, we're basically like inside of a supernova remnant, but because we're like basically inside of it, it looks like it just takes up basically the whole sky. And then you have all these tiny little dots all over the place that look like stars, except they're not stars. All of those are other galaxies. They're all made up of billions of stars. <clears throat> okay, so very, very cool. Um, there's another empty spot. Anybody want to guess at what that empty spot is? Ha <laughs> 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 ha. Yep. I can't. I can't refute that. I'll just stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's the sun. Um, in this particular data set, they didn't want to see the sun, so they just masked it out. Um, I heard someone say the moon. I know my student wants to hear about the moon. I stared at this for way too long. I, I, I completely dug myself into a hole trying to find the freaking moon. It's not in there. It shouldn't be in the blind spot. We can see the moon from, from the northern hemisphere, right? It's not there. Um, and the best I can understand, and I looked up the paper, they don't mention it at all. Um, this is 28 hours of observation. So they just let the telescope observe for 28 hours. The moon moves within 28 hours. So wherever it was in the image, it gets washed out. And it's just kind of gone, just missing. Um, they should have mentioned it in their paper, but they didn't. Um, <laughs> okay. Other things you can do with radio astronomy. Um, some of you may have seen this image from a few years ago um, where they imaged the, the event horizon of a supermassive black hole using a radio telescope the size of the Earth, right? So they combine the, the antennas from all over the Earth, combine them together to create this huge telescope um, and form that, that image. Um, you can do cosmology. You saw a slide that looked a lot like this in um, a previous talk. I honestly can't remember if it was Carl or Cody. I think it was Carl. Um, <laughs> um, where you can study the history of the universe, all kinds of cool stuff. You can look at extreme events like fast radio bursts. Um, you can look at exploding galaxies. So all those little dots in the background, if you zoom in far enough, they all look kind of, well, variations on this. Where you, the galaxy is there in the middle. And then you have all of this crap going all the way, like spewing out um, into what's called the intergalactic medium. Um, the, this is basically like there's stuff falling into the middle of the galaxy that gets spit back out. I like to think about it, this is probably a terrible analogy, but if you ever sat in like an airport uh, uh, bathroom and you flush the toilet and just goes down the drain and then, pff, spits back out. <laughs> um, something kind of like that, right? Um, okay. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so you can do a lot of science. Why else do you want to do radio astronomy? Anytime-ish, anywhere-ish. Uh, so um, you got, th there's a slide that those guys had. They both had this slide that showed like the absorption by the atmosphere and stuff. And how, oh, I gotta go to space. I gotta go to the <laughs> Radio doesn't care. <laughs> we, <laughs> my frequent, my radio frequencies. We don't care. People ask me like. Oh, was it cloudy that day of observation? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, uh, um, another interesting fact, 80% of North Americans can't see the Milky Way from their home. Um, I, that's way higher than I thought it would have been, but uh, that's what it is. Um, in the radio, basically anybody can. Um, so I'll show it to you guys. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to go fast here. Why radio astronomy? This is nerd night. Do I really have to justify why we want to do something this nerdy? <laughs> <laughs> if I do, okay, it, radio astronomy is more niche than optical astronomy. Everyone has a telescope. What about a radio telescope, right? You can play with like electronics and, and, and really nerdy things like that. Um, you get to do advanced math. You, you analyze a ton of data. And the result to everybody else is super underwhelming. What is more nerdy? It's perfect. <laughs> okay, can, what, what can you do? Um, related to radio astronomy. 
Um, there's actually a ton of ways that you can do radio astronomy. Um, and I kind of broke it down into a few little categories here. So um, you can look at data online. Professional, like uh, uh, world-class telescopes, they often post data online and ask people to help them analyze it. Um, so I put up an example there. Um, you can get data from Meerkat, which is um, right next to that telescope from in South Africa that I showed you earlier. Um, and, um, or just in general, go to zooniverse.org. Um, it's a website where you can get involved with all kinds of cool like citizen science uh, projects. Um, you can use your computer to process data. Um, so you, Einstein at Home is an example of uh, you can uh, sign up and when your computer is just sitting there, they will send data from these observatories and your computer will do some analysis crunching in the background while you're not using it. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, you can remote control a telescope. And all of the examples that I've actually found for this, uh, they tend to be school groups only, although it's hard to do an exhaustive look. Um, there might be options uh, for, for anybody. I don't know. Um, what about building your own telescope? All right. So this is what I'm going to go here. Um, so there's a lot of options for this. Again, you can Google. All, you can find many, many examples of how you can build your own telescope. Um, I'm going to focus on the one that I kind of um, um, run. Um, this is called Chart, the Completely Hackable Amateur Radio Telescope. So astronomers are either really, really good or really terrible at acronyms. So Jody Foster's telescope, it's the Very Large Array. <laughs> I like this acronym. Um, so uh, uh, student-driven, I try to make it persistent so you're not relying on um, obscure parts that you can't find, um, that anybody can kind of pick up and, and, and build this thing. I want to make it accessible, so low cost, um, and things where, uh, and post tutorials so you can actually see how to use it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that the tutorials are especially accessible because the students are making them, right? It's not somebody who has a PhD in radio astronomy making the tutorials, it's the students. And they pass that on to the hobbyists and the enthusiasts or the high school students that want to pick it up. Um, and then it's hackable. So the idea is we built a baseline design, but we can kind of break it apart and try different things with it. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> building chart. So it, I have this like kind of runner website. I'll have the QR code at the end. Um, but we have tutorials on how to build chart. And um, so there's a little schematic, how it works. You build a little horn. You have some electronics. You have uh, a little um, uh, software-defined radio, Raspberry Pi, all that fun stuff. Here's a photo of a bunch of like, high school teachers that I had at WSU building their own uh, radio telescopes one summer. Um, and then you plan out your observation. Um, we show you how to um, you know, pick out where in the galaxy. So this is an artist rendering of the Milky Way galaxy where you might want to look, use some software to figure out where on the sky um, you need to look and when, um, and then you go observe. Here's some students doing some tests. Here are my high school teachers um, all out at the, the small lake in Winona. And um, hey, you got to take it out to the desert because that's just what people do. So this is out in the uh, <laughs> painted desert in Arizona. Um, you analyze the data. and. Uh, so you get really kind of weird looking data that you can't understand. Okay, I have more plots, sorry. Um, <laughs> and then you calibrate, and this is where the nerds go, holy crap, there's something there. We actually saw something. This is one of those emission lines that Carl was talking about, the 21 centimeter emission line from our Milky Way galaxy. Um, we can repeat it looking in different directions and we get to learn about how fast the gas is moving when we look in different directions. Um, Remember that, uh, that slide about how if you move out in the galaxy and it's moving faster and faster? Um, and do more stuff. Anytime, any place. Data from downtown Phoenix. You can do it, right? This is where you cannot see the Milky Way with your eyes, but you absolutely can see it in the radio. Um, you can point it directly at the sun. Right, Cody? <laughs> <laughs> and you still see the 21 centimeter line. The sun is not a big deal. All of the data I've shown you has been daytime data. And uh, this one in particular is just pointed right at the sun. So um, I just figured I'd 
kind of close on kind of where we're going with charts, the completely hackable and amateur radio telescope. There's a lot of things that we want to keep doing. Um, there's a QR code there. I don't know if that's going to work very well. Um, the website does not work on mobile, but like if you scan it, you'll have the link and then you can access it on des your desktop if you want. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in building your own radio telescope, you can start with those tutorials that we have that will just take you through and you can look at the data and then it's hackable and you can kind of play around with it and do things that you are interested in. So I will leave that that and see if there are any questions. All right. So I'll just quick start off with your name and what and what you're doing here for Nernay. Uh, my name is Adam Beardsley. Um, I'm going to talk about how anybody, you know, hobbyist, whatever, enthusiast can get involved with radio astronomy. Ah, sweet. So um, is that related to your profession? Um, I'm actually a professor at Winona State. Okay. And my research is around radio astronomy. Um, is this your first time speaking here at Nerd Night? Yeah, it is. And in fact, I've only been to one other Nerd Night. Um, so it seemed like really fun. And I know uh, Dr. Furkenhoff, who runs it, he asked me to come and give a talk. So when I, I moved to Winona three years ago, and Dr. Furkenhoff was one of my uh, like connections when I got here, and he yeah. told me about it right away. That was, so that three years ago, that was in the middle of the pandemic. So yeah. I actually did attend one virtual moon night as well. Uh -huh. um, so that's kind of like what got me coming to him a couple of times. Awesome. Well, uh, what's your, what are your thoughts on nerd night so far? Like what makes it nerd night important for you? Um, I think it's just a lot of fun and it's like an opportunity for people around the community to kind of get together and see what interests each other. Um, it's fun to see talks that are just like are completely off the wall. A lot of people talk about things that um, they don't necessarily do as a li for a living, so I don't know if like like I think people give talks about like things that they do, but also like their just general interests, and that's really fun to just kind of see what people's hobbies are and how much they can nerd out on. Awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to quick add before we wrap this up? Uh, no, I think everyone should come out and check out Nerd Night sometime. I think they do it about once a month. That's really fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, ooh. I just remember one more question. Um, because this is uh, this is your first time speaking for Nerd Night, right? Yep. So what would be your best advice to someone who is probably lacking motivation or they really want to speak, but again, with the lack of motivation, maybe they're just shy in front of an audience. What would be your best advice? Um, I think to just know that um, most of the audience is probably drunk. So you, <laughs> there's not a lot of pressure to, t to speak in front of people. Uh, and the, you know, the few times I've been here, you know, people are just really excited to hear about anything that people want to talk about. So nice. you might have your little passion project that you think is kind of silly, but people want to hear it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. All right. I see one question right up front here. All I need to know is, was there remote control for that light bulb that was 40 million miles away? <laughs> Cody, I think that's for you. <laughs> What other questions do we have? Oh. Oh, no. So the chart. Um, if I want to build my own telescope, what are the two main things I need? I mean, you, you talk about this rat, like a computer, it seemed like, and, uh, and, so, a, and a software-defined radio. But physically, if I'm going to build it physically, what do I need? Um, what, I mean, so we have like a parts list. You go and you, and you pull up. So... Cardboard, aluminum foil. The card, yes, the cardboard you get from the back of Volkmans. They don't care. You you just take it. <laughs> we we've spent we've done many trips out there and just taken the cardboard from the back there. So yeah, cardboard, aluminum foil. Um, there there are a couple of specialized things that you order, like a, an amplifier and a filter, and then a little radio device, and then a computer. That's pretty much it. It's all that goes into it. All right, any other questions for Adam in the back? All right. Dang it, you guys, come on. Somebody ask a question. <laughs> no, okay, so so I know you can't, like, could you bring this to, like, an observatory event? And, like, what if we interacted with this at the observatory? Do you see it on the monitor? That's what you're doing? You don't listen? I want to listen to it. Yeah, so but I love that movie, Contact. So. Yeah. Um, so what I would say is... Um, Okay, so, so the way I, I kind of went really quickly here, but the way chart is kind of designed is um, students come on, they spend a summer working with me, and they choose something that they're going to work on to improve it and, and whatever. Um, 
we had a student last summer and her goal was to make a live feed. So you like see the data in real time. Um, so you can kind of like, you'd be able to move chart around and you should be able to see the line move around as you look in different parts of the galaxy. Um, that is not quite ready for production, but it's close. So um, it's something is, you know, as we're building up observatory nights, we could potentially do in the future. Yeah. All right. I think someone's playing. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. 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 I was. So all these teachers that you are working with, are they local? Where, like, did they come from, like, miles around, or are they all like, kind of local teachers who are interested in what you're doing? So most of them were relatively local. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Actually, not terribly local. So um, Rochester, Twin Cities area. Um, I forget where Cindy was actually from, but somewhere close by. Um, not Winona. Um, and then we had one student or one teacher from California who heard about it and just flew out and did it. Um, <laughs> awesome. So, but, but, so I did this uh, two years ago, I think it was, and uh, there were four people who signed up. We advertised it. Anybody could do it. Four people signed up. We did it. Um, I plan to do it again in the future. Last year I couldn't because Raspberry Pis we couldn't buy. Um, it just was impossible. You couldn't buy Raspberry Pis. So we couldn't get the materials. Um, we will try to do it again in the future. <laughs> have, you ha have you ever had any incidents where you recorded the wrong thing? Someone either trying to bounce the radio signal off the atmosphere or someone turned on the right microwave at the wrong time? Any kind of weird incidents where you picked up crazy things like that? Um, so, yeah, like most of my real research job, so Chart is a fun project. Um, when, I, when I'm actually like working with the professional uh, telescopes, most of the time what we're doing is try to filter out all the stuff that we don't want in the data. So you can do a lot of observations from Winona, from downtown Phoenix. You can't do the very precise measurements that you want to do in those locations. That's why we build telescopes out in the desert. Because it turns out we like to use radios to transmit our popular music, right? That gets in the way. Um, we like to use it to communicate. Um, Airplanes use them. Um, so, so there's a ton of stuff that's, we call it interference, that's in our way we have to filter out of the data. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, most of my job is doing that. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is another um, um, fun thing about Woo, radio nice. telescopes. Um, uh, I, I like to say, like, you know, you know, another nerdy thing about radio telescopes. We have telescopes that are the size of the Earth, and at the same time, there are proposals to take little rinky-dink uh, you know, rabbit ear antennas and stick them on the far side of the moon, um, which could potentially be very beneficial. Yeah. So I have a, I have a quick question. Um, so, I mean, I observe in Chile, in the Atacama. Yep. I saw pictures. You were in South, South America or South Africa, sorry. Was Why? What's, what is that telescope for? What's the goal? What, what are you trying to do with that telescope? Um, yeah, let me see if I... I'm going to go back to a slide where I very briefly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Okay. Um, so remember this, like, history of the universe. I think it was, Carl, you showed the, the yeah, so Big Bang, um, dark, look, I have the same words, dark ages, first stars. Um, so that telescope in South Africa, the goal of it is to map out the universe during and after the dark ages. Um, so Carl said you can't see in anything in the dark ages. That's not true. You can see the 21 centimeter line because it's all hydrogen gas. So you could see it there. Um, that said, it's very difficult to do. So um, that's an ongoing project. All right, got one last question here. Could you talk a little bit about the discovery of uh, cosmic microwave background radiation and how that kind of, I think that kind of kicked off radio tel telescope. Yeah, stuff, didn't so it? it's sort of a history question, and I have a vague understanding of how this worked, but I, I, I'm not necessarily going to have a 100% accurate answer, but, you know, it's nerd night, so I'll just try it. Um, <laughs> so some people working with radio equipment or, or microwave equipment, and um, we're, we're seeing... What's that? Carl Jansky. Was it Jansky? Carl Jansky. Okay, Carl Jansky. Um, and <laughs> um, just kept seeing this background in their data, and they couldn't get rid of it. And they kept seeing, like, there was this extra, like, energy that they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And eventually, they kind of sussed out that, oh, it's actually coming from the sky, not from anything, like, local. Um, and uh, 
so then like studies kind of keep going and going and, and, and researching it and so what you what we can see now I don't have any slides on it or anything but um, yeah so you, you, there's that cosmic microwave background which is like uh, uh, light from just after the Big Bang about 400,000 years after the Big Bang which in cosmic time is like a blink of the eye um, when the universe cooled off sufficiently to go from plasma to neutral gas light just kind of sailed out and um, so that light that we detect is the cosmic microwave background that is light that has been traveling through the universe for about 14 billion years and then we detect it on our little telescopes and things and and, uh, um, and learn about the universe from there um, I don't know if I'm at all addressing what you're actually asking but we could always discuss more <laughs> all right I got one more one more thing the um uh, in the interest of, of public astronomy and, and uh, outreach, uh, I got a, one announcement from Jen really quick. Yeah, first of all, we love infrared and radio astronomy. Um, and if you would like to come and see optical astronomy, um, Merrick State Park on February 10th from 5 to 8 p.m. is Winterfest this year. And we'll have some telescopes out. And I'm trying to get all three of these guys to join me. So they should... Thank you. I'm I'm sorry. I meant to do that during the announcements, but okay. Uh, let's uh, let's have one more round of applause for Adam and all of our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming out to Nerd Night, and uh, we'll see you in February. Thanks again to the No Name Bar and the hosts of Nerd Night for making this whole event possible. To check out more of this nerdtastic event, check out their Facebook at Nerd Night Winona or winona.nerdnight.com. Otherwise, check out to see if there's a Nerd Night near you at nerdnight.com. That's N-E-R-D-N-I-T-E dot com. I'm Del Nazate, and to keep up with all things Winona or the surrounding area, tune in to Culture Click Thursdays at 1230 here on 89.5 KQAL. Or listen to previous episodes of Culture Click on your favorite streaming services. Find links at kqal.org. Creating cultural awareness and understanding. You've been listening to Culture Click. Support for Culture Click is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Culture Click is produced by KQAL FM on the campus of Winona State University. For more information, look us up on the web at kqal.org. And thanks for listening to Culture Click. Culture Click.